Hello everyone, it's Dr Paul Rose back again with another video all about animal behaviour. I'd like to talk about the proximate questions, control and development, Tinbergen's two questions and how they can be used to explain some of the behaviours that we see. Development occurs in the individual animal and it refines the behaviour across the course of the individual's lifetime. Unfortunately, I don't have a real hooper swan, but I do have a nice wooden one that was a souvenir from a trip to Iceland. And Iceland is one of the main breeding grounds of the hooper swan. That's really, really important for behavioral development because the migration route of the swans, they do with their young that they've hatched the summer before they migrate to their wintering grounds. And that's a really nice example of both control and development of behaviour. This is the Wild Fauna Wetlands Trust Reserve, Calaverock, on the Solway Firth in Scotland. In the winter time, Calaverock comes alive with many thousands of migratory water birds. Huge flocks of pink-footed and barnacle geese that have travelled many thousands of kilometres from the high Arctic make Calaverock their home. Thanks to the Gulf Stream, British winters are relatively mild and therefore they offer ideal conditions for water birds and many other species to exist in, whilst back home in their breeding grounds conditions are hard. So even though temperatures might drop below freezing, they can still find a good meal, they can still maintain their health and they can still fatten up on reserves to travel back to their breeding grounds come the spring. The hooper swans that you can see in this clip have a very precisely controlled migratory behaviour. They travel together as families and it's important that they do so for the survival of their youngsters. I love hooper swans, not just because they're an excellent example of Tinbergen's control and development for their uh, migration patterns, but because they pair for life, because they are so loyal to each other and because they really take care of their youngsters. The Icelandic population of hooper swans breeds exclusively in Iceland and winters primarily in the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. The journey from Iceland to the UK and Ireland means hooper swans and their cygnets have no migratory staging posts for respite, refueling and relaxation as they're travelling. The Hooper Swan crosses the North Atlantic Ocean from Iceland to the UK. Weather conditions can be difficult and dangerous and adult swans don't want their cygnets to become tired or exhausted and have to land on the ocean. Consequently, adult Hooper Swans time their migration flights to ensure that they travel in good weather conditions that facilitate the survival of their cygnets by standing the best chance of actually getting to their wintering grounds in the UK and Ireland. So by planning ahead and predicting the weather, the Hooper Swan and its cygnets is able to cover the thousand kilometres or so across the North Atlantic in around about 12 hours, flying non-stop. Given that the Hooper Swan is one of the world's heaviest flying birds, this is an impressive feat of endurance. Once at their wintering grounds, families of Hooper Swans jockey for position, with the largest families gaining control of the best quality resources. So it pays Hooper Swan parents to stay together, to be faithful to one another, because that helps them when they're at their breeding grounds, be more successful at staking a good position for access to food resources and feeding patches. The triumph display that you can see in this photograph and in the previous video of the swans bobbing their heads up and down, calling loudly and spreading their wings is a way for families to exert their dominance over others. So Tinbergen's two questions of control and of development apply to whole areas of the Hooper Swan's lifestyle. 
Developing your skills as a parent through experience means you will raise more signets. Developing your skills as a traveller, experience in planning ahead and knowing when to travel with your signets will mean you can bring more back successfully to your wintering ground each year. And the higher number of signets within your family whilst on your wintering grounds means more control over key resources and more domination of other families to ensure that you are most successful. And when it comes to leaving your wintering grounds and taking your signets back to Iceland so they can see where they should nest, cues the swans use can change by year and with experience. Research has shown that it's not just temperature and day length that initiates the migration back to Iceland. The quality of grass, the sugar and energy content of grass, influences the energy stores that the swans can put on over winter. Likewise, the amount of competition for food in their wintering grounds will also influence when families leave. Those larger families that can dominate these good resources more easily will spend a longer time on their wintering grounds compared to birds that might be pushed to the edges and use more unfavourable resources. When we talk about the development of behaviour, we need to remember that there are many things beyond the animal's control that are going to influence its behaviours later in life. This is the egg of the world's largest bird, the ostrich. This is equivalent to around about 22 regular sized chicken eggs. That's one very large omelette. Ostriches have an incredible system of parental care. The male ostrich is dark black in colour and the female is brown. The male ostrich incubates overnight and the female incubates during the day. So they're both camouflaged against predators based on their plumage colour. The egg of the ostrich provides the growing chick with a lot of nutrition. And consequently, when the chick hatches, it's able to fend for itself. Yes, it just needs its parents for warmth and shelter. So the development of the ostrich chick within this enormous egg will influence the chick's behaviour later in life, dependent on the nutritional quality of the food that the mother was eating before she laid this egg, as well as the location of this egg within the nest. Many other female ostriches will lay their eggs in the nests of an already sitting female. That saves them the job of rearing the chick. The mother ostrich, whose nest that actually is, will allow these females to lay their eggs in her nest because they act as a barrier should predators come along and try to steal an egg. So she preferentially pushes her eggs into the centre of the nest where they stay at a warmer constant temperature and are under less risk of predation because of this wall of other non-related eggs around them. Yes, these non-related eggs might hatch, but if the chick has experienced more fluctuation in temperature and humidity that's going to affect its qualities as an adult bird and therefore the behaviours that it performs. This is a male ostrich with his characteristic black plumes and a white tail and white wing feathers. The black plumage allows him to incubate over night time and he uses the contrast between the white and the black during his courtship display to attract a female. And here is a female ostrich incubating camouflage brown colour during the daytime. You can see that she's moving eggs around her nest. Underneath her, she sat on the eggs that she herself has laid. These spare eggs around her have been egg dumped by other females in her nest. Yes, she will incubate some of these eggs and she will rear these other chicks but she's also preferentially moving these eggs around the periphery of her nest because they are more likely to get predated 
and her eggs are more likely to remain safe. Let's have a look at the egg of another large flightless bird. These are emu eggs. They're a totally different colour and shape to the ostrich egg. They're also smaller in size. The ostrich has evolved to lay its eggs in open, sandy, desert type grassland. The emu lays its eggs in a depression in grass. Camouflage for the desert, camouflage for the grassland. Interestingly, the emu egg and this rather wonderful olive green colour has actually paved the way for our understanding of where the pigments in birds eggs come from. And this harks back to their dinosaur ancestors. This is a really nice link between Tinbergen's first questions, the proximate questions, the development of behaviour, which starts in the embryo, to the evolution of behaviour, why the adult female bird is producing this wonderful green egg. It's thought that the reptilian ancestors of birds who moved out into the open and started to produce nests on the ground, developed coloured eggs as a means of camouflaging their nests and as a way of the parent of this egg knowing that that was the egg it had produced. Subtle differences in the colouring and patterning of colour on the egg can tell the parents whether or not that, that egg belongs to them in their nest. Many different colours are used by birds in the creation of eggshell colourant. One of those colourings is something called bilirubin. And bilirubin is mixed with calcium carbonate, which makes the eggshell. And as the egg passes down the oviduct of the female bird, it twists. And consequently, that causes the colouring and the patterning to be sprayed on. Scientists have been able to identify the pigments in the eggshells of fossilised reptiles and prehistoric bird-like ancestors. And using samples from modern day birds, like the emu, they've been able to see that the same process and the same colouring works. And if you'd like to know more about that, there's an excellent article in New Scientist that will tell you why modern day birds keep giving us amazing insights into the world of the dinosaurs. Development of behaviour within a particular habitat enables individuals of a particular species to avoid competition. These two pine cones have been chewed by a red squirrel. Red squirrels are the native squirrel to the British Isles and they chew their pine cones in a very refined manner so they can extract the most nutrition out of them. So in coniferous woodlands, red squirrels are actually the dominant squirrel because of how they can extract food more energetically efficiently and more easily. Therefore, they can outcompete other squirrels and other rodents that are after the same type of thing. Compare this beautifully chewed pine cone to these rather massacred examples. This is the same species of pine tree that produces those cones but has been chewed by a grey squirrel, incredibly energy inefficient and has destroyed most of the nutritious part of the pine cone that the squirrel was after. So development of behaviour within individuals to make them more refined to enable species specific behaviours to perform can enable a species to become dominant in a habitat. So the introduced grey squirrel, yes, it might have the edge over the red squirrel in certain parts of its range, but in coniferous forests, it's the red squirrel that's developed its very specific feeding style, which it can improve and refine with age that will be the one out competing all of the other species.
Development of behaviour obviously goes along with the traits that an animal possesses, anatomical, physiological, morphology, size and shape, which enables it to fit into its habitat. This is the skull of a red fox. I'm going to have a go at holding up both the top mandible and one of the bottom mandibles because I can't juggle all of it together. But I hope you can see this rather large canine and incisor teeth that the fox has for dispatching its prey. And this particularly sharp pointy tooth here, which is the carnassial tooth. Carnassial gives carnivores their name. The carnassial tooth is the one that is used for shearing flesh. If we look at the equipment, if you like, that evolutionary pressures have provided the red fox with, that's quite a formidable set of jaws and teeth. But the fox has to learn to use that effectively and efficiently to become a good hunter. Yes, hunters are provided with the tools to catch their prey, but the hunting behaviour is learned and developed in the individual. And in many cases, young carnivores starve to death by the end of their first year of independence because they haven't mastered the abilities at being good at hunting and catching prey. So successful is this evolutionary adaptation that we see these types of teeth in all manner of carnivores. Here is the skull of a stoat. The stoat is much smaller than the fox, but is no less adept at hunting. And in fact, the stoat is so good at hunting that it does an amazing dance in front of rabbits to mesmerise them so it can bring down a prey much, much bigger than itself. And here is an example of this rather strange otherworldly dancing that the stoat will do in front of its prey. The much larger rabbit is quite difficult for the stoat to catch. So by throwing its body around and acting very skittishly, it actually ends up mesmerising the rabbit. And therefore, that makes it a much easier prey item to catch. Feel free to go and watch the full dance of the stoat and this rather deadly game of cat and mouse, as it were, in your own time. But it gives you an idea of just how clever and how highly evolved these predation behaviours can be, as well as how they have to develop over the course of the individual's lifetime to ensure that the animal performing the behaviour can be successful. So successful is this evolutionary design, as it were, of these killing teeth for catching and dispatching prey, that we see this similar type of tooth layout across carnivore. You can kind of see a resemblance in skull structure, the orbital bones around the eye, the placement of eye in the skull, the long canine teeth at the front. The stoat is obviously much smaller than the fox, but it has the same types of adaptations for catching and dispatching prey. And if we look at the bottom jawbone of the fox, remember my carnassial tooth, the slicing and dicing of flesh, and we look at the bottom mandible of the stoat, here we've got the same carnassial tooth. I hope you can see that okay. Let me try and manoeuvre. My camera going to focus. I'm struggling. We've got the same carnassial shaped tooth between the fox and between the stoat, which shows the importance of this type of evolutionary adaptation to the development of the hunting and feeding strategy, regardless of the size of the carnivore. So the fox's tooth layout and dentition and the stoat's layout and dentition is the same. So the stoat and the fox, these two carnivores, both in the order carnivora, 
Yes, they might look slightly different, but they have a similar set of equipment for doing a particular job and how they develop their hunting approaches, how they develop their foraging and feeding behaviours is very much dependent on what they have been provided with to enable that behaviour to be performed. So not only within a related group of species, the carnivorous mammals, carnivora, do we see these similar traits. But if we look across unrelated species, we can see that they possess traits that enables behavioural development in a similar way. Here we've got the skull of a tawny owl, and here, which has just collapsed on me, we've got the skull of a sparrowhawk. The sparrowhawk is a volcaniform, the owl is a strigiform, different types of classification of birds, but they both meat eating carnivorous birds, so they both have a predatory hooked beak for shearing flesh. And actually this is not the killing mechanism of the bird, both the true birds of prey and the owls kill and dispatch their prey with their feet. The bill is used for tearing and shearing flesh and for, particularly when they're feeding youngsters, for breaking up their prey to small manageable pieces. But even though an owl and a true bird of prey are not in the same overall taxonomic classification, they still possess these very, very similar features, this pointy, very sharp hooked beak, because as an evolutionary process, that enables them to develop their style as hunters best. So in a very similar way to my stoat and to my fox, we've got these similar features that allow for behavioural development. Regardless of your relatedness between species, if that fits the particular behaviour you need to perform, you will be provided with that particular trait. In many group living species that have a very specific hierarchy or social organisation, specific control and development of behaviour patterns are crucial to group functioning. Passing on of information and knowledge sharing within primate troops, for example, like these squirrel monkeys, enables protection of the youngsters, effective feeding and foraging, and defence of the territory that the animals live in. But it's not just in these primate species that sharing of information is essential to the control and development of behaviour. In some perhaps surprising species, like the African buffalo, the group dynamic is essential to the coordination of key behaviours. Buffalo herds are a matriarchy. The oldest, wisest females in the group control what the group does, but they do so in a democratic manner. Every morning, the oldest, most experienced females in the group will orient themselves in the direction of where they think the day's best grazing is to be found. The experience of all of the adult females is taken into account and consequently, the group moves off in an average direction of all of the points that the oldest females have directed themselves in. Therefore, this sharing of information is essential to the finding of the most appropriate feeding areas for the herd overall. So many of these behaviours are what we call evolutionary stable strategies. That's a strategy whereby there is no other feasible alternative that can be better and consequently for fitness benefits for the individual and for the population everybody must adopt it. These birds are yellow-billed storks they feed by touch. They move their beak from side to side whilst keeping it open within the water column. And when they feel something that might be edible, the beak instantly snaps shut. This feeding mechanism has evolved because the water systems they live in are cloudy with reduced visibility. Consequently, every single yellow-billed stork has its feeding behaviour controlled in exactly the same way because no other strategy would work as well for this species 
within this habitat. And my final example of behavioural development for you is in the eider duck. The eider duck is a cold water dwelling sea duck. It comes from the northern hemisphere around the Arctic Circle. And this is a complete nest of the eider duck. This is all eider down that the female has taken from her own breast to line her nest. It's incredibly thick and it's incredibly warm. And if I pull some out for you, you can see how well all of their eider down sticks together. The development of the behaviour in the eider to incubate and to be a good mother to her nest eggs and ducklings is very much dependent on her nest building behaviour. So the more that she develops through experience where she builds her nest, how she lines her nest properly and covers her eggs over when she stops incubation to go and feed and drink will mean she will hatch more ducklings. So again, another lovely example of evolution has provided the tool for the eider to live in a very inhospitable habitat where they need a really, really thick, warm covering, both for them as adult birds going about their daily business, but also that they can use to help develop their own growing youngsters as well. And to give you my fun pub quiz fact all about the eider duck, the scientific name of the common eider, Somateria melisma, actually means very soft, very soft, which I just think is brilliant because that relates completely to the type of down they produce. And we know it's also very soft because we as human beings have farmed eider ducks in Iceland. By farming them, we gather them in safe locations where they naturally would nest. And then once the female has finished on her nest and her ducklings have left the nest, we go and collect eider down for our own pillows and bedding material. Very soft, very soft very warm, very warm. A brilliant example, again, of the development of behaviour within the individual based on the tools that evolution has provided it with. I hope this short presentation has provided you with some understanding of the control and development of behaviour, how it provides fitness benefits and how it links to evolutionary stable strategies so that populations and the behaviours that those populations can perform give the most adaptive benefits possible to the individuals within them.